This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, thank you very much, Neil and uh, Bill, for the invitation. I'm really uh, honored to come on this uh, fellowship here to uh, uh, tell you a little bit more maybe how we are managing the resource, the peat resource in Canada. And say, when I say we, we can talk a little bit about we because um, uh, it involves the uh, Canadian uh, Sphagnum Peat Moss Association, which regroups all the peat producers of Canada. And I've been working in collaboration with them since 1992, uh, exchanging information and all that. So, um, uh, but more specifically today, I will talk about the in all we go about to restore uh, industrial peatland and the main uh, factors that uh, impedes this uh, recovery. So the plan for today, I will talk a little bit about the restoration context in North America which is uh, different than uh, what's going on in Europe. Uh, the restoration ecology of peatland, so introducing the, our conceptual framework of research and the main abiotic factor in peating and talking about how we go about to evaluate success. And if uh, I will check, somebody will check on time, and if I have time, then, um, uh, because most I will talk about sphagnum dominated peatland or the, you know, the sphagnum peat moss, but I can start with what we're doing uh, with fan research, fan restoration research, and the pool also restoration within the peat. Then. So the business of horticultural peat, um, if we are impacting an ecosystem environment, why should we go on to do that if there's alternative? Uh, there might be some alternative to using peat in growing media, such as the core, the, the cocoa fibers, or rock wool, or, but all of them will have, you know, its array of problems also in terms of its use, its environmental problem. Peat is good, just uh, the people that do not know sphagnum, it's because they have this amazing cell structure of alternating lives, uh, living cells and dead cells with lots of pores. And, and it works a little bit like a slinky, you can compress it but as soon as you release the pressure, then you have the structure. So it's really good that wicking the, the, the water and having water into the substrate and keeping some water there, but also we have with all this for this aeration and we can get oxygen down to the root. So that's just the basic, get a good cation exchange capacity and all that. I think Neil and, and, and uh, Bill could tell you a lot more about its property, but it's just a fantastic, uh, uh, medium to grow plants in, and it's not so easy to all at once get rid of it. They tried that in England, uh, they forced the government just ban the use of peat, but they realized the professional growers just could not uh, go away from it. And just to tell you a little bit about, a little more about why it's not so easy to shift and get rid all at once of the peat, is we're thinking compost. Okay, in the last 10, 15 years, we all agree compost. Composting now, green residue is a lot. Uh, it's more stable and we can get better growing media out of compost. But the problem in places like in Europe or Central Europe is that the green residue are used uh, for, bur for the, the thermal station the, uh, the, uh, pr to produce energy. So they are not easily available. It's not a product that it's, it's too costly for the professional grower to use. So then, for them, they rely on peat. And then if you go for the, quar the, co the core, the coming from the cocoa fibers, then again, there's other issue when you look at the overall life cycle analysis, where it comes from. And apparently the transport is kind of polluting on these old boats also in the ocean with these diesel boats that are not so up to date. So I think we have to, all this product, I'm not saying this is yet the best thing to use, but I think now we have to, to look more at the overall picture, the social impact, the traveling, and the, the, the whole life cycle analysis of, of, of the different products. So when you harvest a peatland, uh, you usually set uh, ditches every 30 meters. This is the main ditches, and you have this vacuum drown uh, um, tractor that will uh, harvest the peat. So you harrow the peat surface, let it dry in the sun, 
Two, three days later, you go with a big vacuum, pick it up, two, three, four milliliters at a time, drop it there, then you charge it onto trucks that take it to the plant. So some large scale operation will look like this. And yeah, just one, we don't see trees, we don't see seeds, nothing is left. And nothing, we know that 30 centimeter below the soil, the peatland, there's no seed bank left. Okay, so it's not that. So the first question we ask, what is the ecological distance to restore this? How do we fix this gap between what you saw and what a natural peatland can look like? You know, it's, it's quite a step. That's what we, uh, and I just say what I'm showing today comes from, you know, it's been developed with lots of people. It's not all at once. It looks easy, but we worked 20 years in, a, in partnership with the Canadian peat industry. And this is like, I have close to 22 partner. And the way it works in Canada is that the federal government, the research council, they say that if the industry is interested, when they put $1, we put $1 for financing the research. So more or less, it, it, it's the way it lies, it goes. And then through these um, uh, 20 years, there was numerous you know, postdoc, PhD students, and master students, and research fields assistant, and volunteer. Even I know some students from uh, Cornell came and worked up uh, with us. So um, just to say that uh, I'm grateful for all the work of these uh, students. So the way we work is, first, we start by comparing the reference ecosystem, so which is the notion of these, a set of natural ecosystem in a region to what has been degraded. And we look at the degraded ecosystem to see what is this ecological distance we have to fill. You know, what should we um, uh, do? And then we do that by comparing from my part, because I'm the plant ecologist, but we are a multidisciplinary team. There's people that do the same thing with hydrology, or the microbiology, the microbes population. But for me, I will more focus today on, on my specialty within the team, which is the plant ecology. So I compare the plant structure, the composition, how it differs, and the different functions, how it differs. And if you take mill peat, as I've shown you, the distance is much greater than when we used to block cut peat. Uh, like this is what we used to do traditionally, or the way that now, uh, that some people are still doing it, but on a smaller scale. But the big distance is really more what, my research has been focused mostly on this, but we are doing research in that area that I will not talk about today. So if we do no management in a sphagnum dominated peatland, we uh, inventory 395 abandoned peat field all across Canada mostly than the eastern part, this is where the industry mostly is. And I just want to draw your attention that if you have natural peatland and compared to the vacuum, and here our ecosystem, were, it's close to 600 uh, plots, you know, that we took in natural peatland throughout the, 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 the eastern part of Canada. Look, in general, in peatland, you'll find about 70, 75% of sphagnum where there's barely any, and what you found there is mostly what you found in the ditches, but not so much in the peat field. Okay, the same thing with the ericusher shrubs, you know, there's a lot more ericusher shrub natural peat than, than in a degraded system. And look at the bare peat. You know, we have no bare peat in the natural system, and this is just, you know. And then we did the same thing with fan, which is in a different system. Okay, bog are dominated by sphagnum mosses, Fen are dominated by sedges and brown mosses, another type of mosses. Fen peat is starting more to go into growing media, but mostly it's being used a lot for energy uh, consumption in Ireland, Central Europe, in Russia, Belarus, and these places. But we look in these different provinces, including here um, in Michigan, the, the, because as you go down in the peat profile, in the peatland, you get down to the fan layers because the, your peatland develops as you know, a lake bottom and will start to accumulate with organic material. Then sedges, typha, plants like that will start to fill it up and that's where you get your fan peat where you are still have inputs from 
the um, uh, different streams around or from the mineral ground flowing through it. And then with time, you have accumulation of the organic matter. Then slowly, you get rid of the influence of the mineral, the mineral trophy or from the um, inputs from the uh, runoff of the different streams. And you'll get only the influence. The, the system will be fed only by rainwater. And then pH will go down. Sphagnum gets in the system. Sphagnum will get the pH kicks in the pH to go up and down. And then looking now, comparing 22 uh, peat extracted sand compared to 10 on this term, then we found that here we, there was two techniques sometime of getting the peat out. Sometimes it was drain, not drain. But you see the sedges, the carrot species in natural peat are in much higher abundance where they are barely present in these abundant system. And the sphagnum, the richer sphagnum species, so I know centrally and all that, not so much that you found, they closely not there. So, you know, we see that even though system has been abandoned for a long time, up to 40 years, they are not there. Second step now, we have to work to define goals. If you want to do restoration, you have to define your goal. If you don't know your goals, it's hard to evaluate your success. You don't know where you're going. But goals cannot, only, cannot be done only by scientists or ecologists minded. You have to take care of what's going on around you in your society and your community. But ecologically, we know that the restore ecosystem will not be like the original one. So you have to define your goals that will be that, but usually nobody will put, we're just going to restore the original ecosystem that was there before. We cannot do that. We don't have the same climatic history. It will not be the same evolution. We're on the, on the under different climate now. So definitely the restoration system. The restore system will be there sometime in the time. So we have this time scale here. Goal, defining goal, it really different, differs from your community. I've been involved with uh, people working in Alaska. And their main concern in Alaska, if we're going to work with the peatland, the was company, then what is all the fastest way we can again stabilize the peat so we won't get all the peat to go in the streams and clog the rivers that are so important for the salmon industry, it's the fishing industry. So I can tell you, if you talk with anybody in Alaska, the first thing they will be thinking is, hey, peat should be stabilized as soon as possible after we finish using the peat for uh, whatever uh, reason. In Canada, with the peat industry, the horticultural peat industry. We did several workshops and all that. And after uh, different um, discussion, the general long-term goal we decided it was to restore the most unique characteristic that defines peatland ecosystem, which is its capacity to accumulate peat through time, so to sequester carbon through time. Peatlands are the most efficient ecosystem we have on this planet per you know, square meter or per volume that can sequester carbon on a long time. You know, after that, you'll have the coal formation. Uh, but really, uh, uh, the peat is more efficient than you can have forest. Because forest, you plant trees, but 200 years down the line, the trees dies again. And the carbon is put back into the uh, recirculation. So that's the general long-term goal, long goal that we put together. Because in North America, in, in mostly in Canada, we were in a wetland system. We use a wetland system. If we leave it, you usually birch will invade. It will turn into a birch woodland or a pine woodland, and we have plenty of woodlands in Canada. But in southern, even though we have a lot of peatlands in Canada, there's a, plenty of it, we don't have so many in the south nearby the urban area. You know there's a lot of pressure on the wetlands. So that's where uh, we decided to, to work. And this was influenced by the Canadian and USA uh, policy of no net loss of wetland and the, the USA wetland hacks, you know, overall. And, and the reason it was influenced by that is because the clients are mostly Americans. 85, 80, 85 percent of the peat is sold in the States. And so we, 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 we are taking into account some of the um, concerns that the clients. Restoration limits, like I, I told you, impossible to restore the original ecosystem by prior to peat extracting activities. This is not, you know, uh, one of the goals. 
and peat is not a renewable resources within human lifetime, but the potential is. Here what I say, you always have to define this when you start talking about this. And here I'm talking, I'm just defining the spatial area as being what is owned, let's say, by a peat company, okay? If we compare it to the potential of all of our, all above, all across Canada, yeah, you could say peat is renewable because it's tiny what we are extracting compared to the amount of peat that we have in Canada, but a lot of it is on the permafrost and not available, okay? So the short-term goal is really to favor the establishment of spinal mosses or now mostly I'm doing a lot of research on the brown mosses and sedges depending on the mineralogy. And mostly it is well known how these spinal mosses are really ecosystem engineered. They are the key species in the northern <coughs> hemisphere to get uh, peatland in the, uh, in the system. So there's a, a, a third step that I'm skipping, which is all the planification, which is really important to succeed in restoration. But as ecologists, we work a lot on defining what are the constraints to why is it that our system is not going along that way naturally, and how can we ameliorate this uh, constraint? They can be environmental, and that's mostly all my earlier research was been done in, in the uh, sphagnum type of peatland. They can be a problem of dispersion, and this, I'm not doing much research on this because we did it in the beginning. Things do come in, the plants, the, the, the spores, and all that, but the conditions are so harsh, nothing established, so we know we have to just bring the plant material in. So uh, you won't hear a lot much about research about that. And this is the interspecific interaction, plant-plant interaction, they do come in for the fans, but I will not discuss this much today. So in the process of ecosystem restoration, then we will also do some monitoring to uh, adapt. Okay, so if we do no management, things that happen. We know that the peat oxidation will continue at a rate of 5.7 millimeter per year. So it's a net carbon emission. You have an ecosystem, you wonder, you use a resource, and if you abandon the system, it goes on. You see here trees that are established, they get uprooted through time. And there's um, Dr. Uh, Maria Strack, she's from University of Calgary, and she's really our carbon flux specialist working on all these questions within our group. If we do no management, all the water com chemistry is unstable because it's coupled with, we get a greater water table fluctuation also. So we have a problem with nutrient and, and in the chemistry. And this we work with, uh, Jonathan Price is a peat and from University of Waterloo, and myself, I do work on uh, the chemistry. Peat erosion, the water will impede, you know, the vegetation return. So uh, we have to take care of that, and also the wind, you know, will impede the vegetation return. So this is all this, this different aspects. And if we do, in some cases, do nothing, we'll have the woodland would replace um, on the sphagnum mosses. So either here you see the uh, birches or the pine woodlands. And we get severe constraint by uh, the frost heaving. I'll come back on, the, on this. And if we don't restore, here this is a site I visited in Colorado. Um, somehow in Colorado, 100 to 120 years ago, they, the, the silver mine, they had to use peat in the process. And uh, these are two colleagues, uh, David Cooper from the um, University of Colorado, from the Boulder, and Rob Chambers from uh, Michigan Tech University. And we do a lot of exchange because they do, they've been working on fan restoration mostly. Uh, and now they're starting to adapt some of our, our uh, techniques. Uh, this is the straw mulch that uh, you will see later, but some of our techniques. And these sites, you know, this is a site abandoned between 100 and 120 years. And with all the harsh conditions, plants do not come back on the peat. It's not so um, easy. And then if you have a fan, then you get this kind of ruderal species that you have to compete with, okay? Just to give you an example, you won't go into that, but just to say that we did a lot of work to understand if we were introduced plants, what can we do to help mostly the sphagnum establishment? All our research has been key to that. And this is the website 
where we have all our publications. If you go on the, it's all in English, a website, you can have access to all the publication of this. Uh, and what I wanted to say that what is in yellow are the three necessary steps that needs to be done. If you don't omit one of these steps, you won't succeed to restore peatland. You need to reintroduce your plant material. You need to protect it after that mulch it because the mosses have no roots, okay, no way of controlling their loss, loss of water. And still, even if you do these two things, you need to block the former drainage system. You need to re-wet the site. The combination of these three actions will lead you usually to successful. One example of one of these, let's say, uh, uh, line of work is uh, the sudden, the abiotic factor, the peat surface when we abandon them can get very hot, can be really hot, up to 50 degrees C. Um, the peat, at first we were wondering, is it because there's some toxicity that the plant don't come back? There's no toxicity. And actually, even nitrogen is, is there because you have oxidation, but no plants is taking it up. So you have even more nitrogen than a natural peat. Plant. So that should not be. But then you have this biological cross, algae or lichen sometimes. And this really impedes the mosses to have access to the water underneath. So there's a breakage in the uh, capillary action. So we wanted to know at the same time, OK, so I, I have my colleagues looking at the climate, microclimate, and what's going on in hydrology. And myself, I go in the lab. And then I wanted to know what kills the mosses. When, when are they dead, really? You know, if I reintroduce them, what adverse condition can they sustain? So either with temperature or here just submitted them to some known relative humidity created by soil, like they were suspended in the air, and then looking back for 10 weeks, you know, if they would start to regrow again, what if they were dead or not. So. Um, that's the way, and, and with this, I found out that, you know, if your relative humidity is low just for a few hours, every, everything is, is dead. And this is testing like six different species and different treatments. But when we get somewhere around 50%, you know, I know it, my plants can stay alive for a good six days. Uh, and, and that's what you have to find. What, and then you know relative humidity will always go up in the night little bit and but it's the hot days we wanted to know what care so we know it's even though you put your plants there and a lot of that if you get that drought period you will lose all your material and then again working in collaboration with people working on microclimate then we look at what does the addition of the straw mulch compare when you are bare peat and really we ameliorated a lot our uh, uh, interface condition between the peat and the atmosphere. And then we started to try different type of mulching. We did up to 17 different type, uh, what would be the best. And it just happened that the straw mulch, which is the cheapest and decompose quickly when you get all this final, that, that was the one that worked really uh, nicely. Um, Rewetting. So we did some. Uh, Try some rewetting when we just, uh, you see this is a drain peatland here where the water table fluctuation, this is a water table would be between my, uh, 80 centimeter below the surface and, and 40. And growing to, as August gets drier, you know, we go down to one meter. A natural peatland will also do the same thing. But, you know, not go so much lower than 40 centimeter and we know in general, we have to keep around that figure to, to have the plants alive. And then we know that if we block the ditches here to try to rewet, is it sufficient? Well, it is good in the spring. But when again you arrive in the drought period in July, August, we still have a gap that is too much to keep the plants alive. So there's action that needs to be there. So to see if you only block the ditches, you don't get your water table back to where you want it. And, and this is where the mulch will do uh, the job, a combination of rewetting and mulching. So uh, we started to do bonds and bankment. We did more, more than just blocking the ditches. Can we redistribute the water through the system, through the whole uh, peatland? 
So if you look, this is a, a, a site that we restored in New Brunswick. And there was almost a, a meter and a half, two meters different between this pool here in the peatland and this uh, road access. And again, your scale, this is 30 meters here. So you see these bonding we did to keep the water, uh, to redispute it and see uh, what it would do. And we compare, then we put these um, uh, water wells all across it and into the unrestore part, just to see where we were hard at into our restoration. Now follow me because it's a bit, it's, it's easy, but it's just we inverted the, uh, the, the legend. If we just look at the water table on the top, this is the red is the restore, the natural peatland, harvested peatland. So, uh, and again, this is minus, I mean, 20 centimeter below the peat surface, 80 centimeter. And, and you see how uh, the restore is actually wetter even than the natural nearby peatland. Uh, so which is really good uh, in the system. But what is more important for the plant? It's not so much the water table, and if there's a group should know that, it's more you than yeah, our psychologists in general, is the tension, <laughs> the water tension. And, and we know that the mosses, the spinal mosses, you need to keep it above uh, minus 100 millibar in order that the cell can have access to the water from the peat. And uh, here, this is a reverse from there. This is a restore the green line. And this is the untreated, so they unrestore. But just look, we know now this is this is really not good for the for for the system. So if we do a combination of blocking and redistributing the water, we keep the spinal that we just reintroduce within above that uh, minus 100 millibars. So this is this combination of um, of these two actions that we know works best for the. Uh, <coughs> Now, through all this process, we do some short-term monitoring and some longer-term because it's a developing process because we're doing some small trials to solve a problem, but we're doing some large-scale one and, and, and trying to see and how to adapt. So through this loop of monitoring, and this is, this is the important, uh, important part. If ever any of you get involved in the restoration ecology uh, uh, project, an ecological restoration project, there's need to be a component three and five years down the line at least to go back and see if you've, you know, what's been done. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.